as old as civilization itself. One may assume that the Vale were the very first civilization. The last queen of the Vale was named Etziri, who owned fabulous treasure. She allegedly sacrificed all those who opposed her, as Ziosa's translation of the second
their communion, but with love. By all accounts, it wasn't God that the veil were trying to reach. Said communion took place during the harvest moon, and Doriani was at the heart of this event. did many others. Some people were changed. On the golden page that mentions this, the words sleep, nightmare, and the beast also were mentioned, and that the veil had failed themselves. This may be a reference to the veil over soul, which is also some of the classes. Siosa believes that the end of the Veil of Civilization must have been very similar to the fall of Sar. Batching this information together, it may be that the Veil were expecting to save their civilization at a so-called communion, which was possibly related to Doriani's Crayola Virtue Gem. Mary encountering the veil. Years 900 to 400 BIC. The Asmeri people hail from the Asmerian mountains. They first encountered the veil about 500 years before the veil fell, or about 900 BIC. The veil helped the fledgling, fledgling civilization advance, but guarded their knowledge of virtue gems. After the veil fell, 3,126 veil refugees assimilated into the Asmeri civilization. This is from Imperialis Conceptus 1 IC. Darkest pharaohs so descended his 80,000 tribes, men and women, through the tomb lands to his Ezala Vale. There he planted his banner upon Itziri's grave with these words founded our great and eternal empire. The veil closed their eyes to flesh and stone, to blood and bronze. We are not veil, we are Asmari. For now and forever, our eyes are open. So built his capital upon the bones of his ala vale and baptized its son. From there, Caruso formed the first legions and proceeded to conquer the lands beneath the mantle, clearing it of the mindless constructs and fierce abominations left in the wake of the fall. True to his word, Caruso ensured that his people lived open. The ancient Valish centers of learning and power were sealed and quarantined. Thaumaturgy was outlawed, and those who strained themselves with Valish folly were burned for their sin. The tears of the Magi, too, dangerous to be destroyed, too dangerous to be destroyed, were gathered up supreme effort to erase the past, a primitive reaction born to primitive times, in the opinion of this humble historian. Light of Rekia. Five years after his father's death, Emperor Sespero II was dead. Although accounts of the exact details differ, Spiro 
is dismembered by something referred to simply as a dark being. It was General Alano Freccia who avenged the Emperor's death and who triumphed in driving away the pervasive darkness enveloping what would become the Imperial Heartlands. Though it seems fanciful to contemplate a portion of our empire cast into perpetual night, as Marian writers of the, of the time were unified in their depiction, perhaps it was caused by peculiar weather patterns or some thaumaturgical residue of the fall. On this matter, this humble historian is left in the uncomfortable state of pure conjecture. On the first sacrito of Berici, 35 IC, Alano himself wrote that our legions drove the dark being deep into the re recesses of its land, of its lair, and sealed it away for eternity. Having returned the gaze of Solaris to those lands, stretching from the foot of the mantle to the axiom ranges of Alano, Rekia returned to Sarn. In the absence of a clear Urusos succession, Alano was crowned emperor and the imperial heartlands were named in his honor. With the former realm of the Vale thus tamed and settled ancestors, the Eternal Empire saw a long period of peace and prosperity under an unbroken line of Frakia emperors. To care for this empire with eyes open, a traditional vow was made by the High Templar upon the coronation of an Eternal Emperor. Rise of Chittas several decades, the Frisius family passed down their rule to their kin through generations of inbreeding. The last of the Frisian ruler was Isaro, described as a madman. Isaro was unable to produce an heir, likely due to generations of inbreeding, rendering him impotent. Wondering how to best choose his successor, Isaro discovered an obscure tome dealing, detailing the tradition of his Marian ascendancy. It was from his reading where Isaro came up with the idea of the labyrinth, using it as a way to decide who the next emperor will be, just as the Marians chose their ruler. The first person to complete the labyrinth will be crowned the next emperor of the Eternal Empire. Chittas, a member of the Barandas family, one of the most powerful and influential merchant family, families in the empire, saw this as an opportunity, as a chance to have a Barandas seize the throne. A better outcome for the empire compared to Isaro's continued rule were a wealthy commoner who may pass the labyrinth through blind luck, so he believed. Chittas prepared himself for the day he would face the labyrinth. He not only trained himself for the labyrinth, but with the help of his uncle, Kadiro, schemed and bribed his way into obtaining every advantage he could by schematics of the labyrinth during its construction, hiring servants to plan provisions for his use, and killing anyone who could compromise his role as emperor. Chitta succeeded in passing the labyrinth, and on his first queso of Urusi, 1319 AC, an 
is how he came up his throne to Jidas. Jidas' first decree as emperor was to imprison Esaro in his own labyrinth for the rest of his life. history, there was a thaumaturgist named Mal Mal Malagaro. Sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing that and all these other names, um, but uh, I'm doing my best here. Um, Malagaro's research centered on virtue gems and how their qualities might be transferred to humans. His main technique was to essence of a gem via a device called Malagaro's Spike, although it never seemed to work terribly well. Apart from the spike, Malagaro created elementals and a mysterious darkness that covered the land. At the end of his life, he created the Baleful Gem, either a synthetic virtue gem sudden demise, but we do know it was divided at least into the Outer Empire and the Inner Empire. The Empire's capital at the time was Sarn, and despite the centuries of neglect, the remaining architecture suggests the Empire was fairly prosperous. The Emperor at the time was Chidas, although we don't know much about man of the forces that would destroy him. While the umpire's citizens were Asmarin, the slaves were of other races, including Isomites, Marakath, and Guru. It seems these other races were not native to Rayclast, or at least not part of the Rayclast covered by the umpire, but were separate civilizations. At the time, the leading thaumaturgist was Malagaro. Like Malagaro, he experimented with virtue gems. But unlike Malagaro, he just surgically implanted them into the test subjects. And his efforts meet, or met with far more success than Malagaro's. Malachi had slaves mining gems in thaumatic sulfite and a supply of test subjects from the emperor. The results of this surgical process were known as chemoids. Emperor Chittas said that these glorious gems have brought us within spreading distance of godhood. And the empire's defenses most famous creation, however, was known as the Gemlin Queen. She was originally a favorite of Emperor Chittas, named Diala, but annoyed him and was given to Malachi to experiment on. She fell in love with him, and he reshaped her into a most impressive Gemlin. Righteous and devoted to both fairy and country. Fair. <laughs> Not fairy. To. Let me start over. Righteous and devoted to both faith and country. High Templar rule struck little hardship in, in gathering others to this godly cause. Sarn's own Lord Mayor Andir and Victaro, Victario, the people's poet, Archbishop Geoffrey of Governor Castoff of Strider, Stridevol, and Commander Adas of Highgate. Together, these warriors 
Sisters of Purity launched an uprising against the Kevlar. Valmatak was here. Kevlar hoped he would snatch his, this empire from the claws of Deflory and return it to humanity. The Purity Chronicles, Book 1, Numbers of Insurrection. Meanwhile, outside the Imperial Club of Valmaturge's laboratories, discontent grew. Ethelred, named the Purity Rebellion, sought to overthrow Emperor Jitus and destroy the Valmaturges and their gremlins. The Purity Rebellion was led by High Templar Vol, the overall leader, Victario, the People's Pope, Lord Mayor Andar of Sun, Archbishop Geoffrey of Regia, Governor Castel of Strider, Commander Agus of Hadley. The Purity Rebellion sought help in many places. Victario raised support among the common citizens of the Empire. Victario sought help from Thane Rigwald of Isan Esimur, perhaps a vessel nation. Vol sought the help from King Kaom Kaom of the Karuan. Vol also sought help from Sakemak Deshret of the Varaket. The Esamites. High Templar Vol had Victario entreat Thane Rigwald of Asama Esamur. Isomites to rebellion. Stirred by Victorio's impassioned words, Rickwald mustered his blood bound clans, and on the third Fiero of Derby, 1333 IC, took to the fields of Glaren in open rebellion against Governor Gaius Centauri. Such was the colorful splendor of a thousand tartans and banners that the Esamite uprising now became known as the Bloody Flowers of Rebellion. Though Centauri's Kevlin's le Kevlin legionnaires slew three Esamites and for every one of their own fallen, the Bloody Flowers won the day through sheer fury-driven courage. Governor Centauri fled to Sun only to return in Estrel. Bastiri and southern garrisons. Little did Centauri know that by so, by so weakening those forces, he was playing right into the Vol's hands. The Purity Chronicles, Book 2, Bloody Flowers. Esomer was ruled by King Skoff, notorious for subduing his citizens to slavery and poverty. Gaius Centauri's imperial army. It is possible that the Battle of the Bow Bridge was part of it, this campaign. After Rigwald's victory, he fought alongside the army of Purity in the Battle of Sarn. The Karuai. Defeat of Mercius Mer Lion. Marcius Lion Eye's eternal legion stationed at Lion Eye's watch. In a man to man fight on open ground, a Kevlin legion would have slaughtered Chaos Karuai warriors like so many pigs in a pen. But Chaos had no intention of engaging Lion Eye in a fair fight. By absorbing some heavy losses and feigning a chaotic retreat, into ordering his Kevlins to abandon their tower shields so they might pursue and rout the fleeing Karuai. It was not out of recklessness that Lion Eye plucked such a decision. The 
and studied for a treaty with the world's finest military tutors. The Norwegianers shed protection in favor of nobility. Hyeri and her Bow women broke cover and rained down upon the Germans from the cliffs above. The valiant Marcius Lion
supposed to use Lady Tiala to fuel it, but she refused and it tore just a small rift. He used this small rift to enter its bowels and Tiala blames herself for that. To get rid of it, his opponents, he awakened the beast and used it to cause the cataclysm to destroy everyone. Sankatla Tishra to seal it within its lair deep within the mines of the Highgate. The mayor of Cathan was charged with the garden. The seal ever since, while the beast slumbered inside the beast, Malachi is working on inciting another cataclysm to reshape the to world. To a vision, to his vision. And somebody has to stop it. is a small island off the southeast coast of Rayclast. We don't know why Oriath was first colonized, but it seems to have been well established and prosperous at the time of the Empire's fall. So it must have been at least settled and under construction during the Empire's peak. An enriching forest in the inner Empire is the Fel Shrine. The ruins of an Obviously, High Templar had an interest in the Empire, presumably from people from the Empire colonized Oriath and brought their religion along and were stranded when the Empire crumbled. The capital of Oriath is Theopolis and contains at least historical currently Dominus, and many of the crimes that court prosecutors are things like, prosecutes things like theosophical pride, public heresy, and resisting Templars' authority. So it seems fairly likely that Oriath is some kind of theocracy run by the Templars. Even the name Theopolis suggests religious devotion. bears a number of people from Oriath. Some people were shipwrecked, but many were exiled for crimes, minor or major. The current High Templar is a man named Dominus, who controls the Ebony Legion as well as the Templars. He recently acquired an interest in the history of the Empire. Dominus 
Artemis works in the laboratory at the top of the tower known as the Center of God, but his assistants General Gravacious and Piety gather information and resources. Gravacious set up a temporary barracks in Sar near Lunar, Lunar's temple and seems to be responsible for seeking out the artifact known as the Twist and perhaps the Ribbon Spool. Was originally named Euphidia and worked as a thaumaturgist and prostitute in Theopolis. Currently, she is more of an archaeologist, roaming Ray Glass, investigating the works and techniques of the Empire's most famous thaumaturgists, including Chevron and Malagaro, as well as trying to reproduce their experimental results for herself. Like Malachi, she virgin gems surgically, although judging by the Derritus in the lowest floor of the Lunaris temple, she has not yet reached Malachi's level of skill. Okay guys, that's all I got for the reading. Um, uh, I really hope you liked the video. I was kind of torn between whispering and doing soft speaking, but I just obviously went with whispering, so um, if you like the video, please hit that thumbs up button, and uh, uh, please, by all means, leave a comment below, and uh, let me know what you think, um, and uh, please, if you have not fed the llama yet, please feed the llama. Uh, the llama is very hungry, and uh, he needs your help, so if you could please subscribe and feed the llama, um, I would love you forever. So that's all I got. I will see you in the next video. Bye.